Welcome to another episode of After Dark. This is my series where I talk a little bit about the origin of some of the stories that I've released, whether in written form, but mostly and especially those that, that you've already seen or heard, hopefully, on this channel. So I want to talk a little bit about the ruins on the loch. I have not released the written version of that story yet, at least uh, not at the time of this recording. But what I have done is I uh, I did a audio production of it for the Ghastly Tales podcast and there is a version of that available on this channel. So if you haven't listened to the runes on the lock, please do go and watch that video first or listen to it first. I'll leave a link in the description below to that because I don't want to spoil the story for you. So the runes on the lock is actually quite a new story. I wrote it uh, just a few months ago. Quite often, a lot of a lot of the stuff that I narrate and do audio productions for stuff that I've I've written some time ago. But recently, I've been taken to to uh, writing and then not having too much distance from it before I start doing the, the audio adaptation. And I think there's pros and cons to to either either way of doing that. If you do it quickly, to a degree, it feels the story feels alive. It feels spontaneous and organic um, but if you give some time sometimes you maybe snag some things in it that that you wouldn't otherwise have done so the runes on the lock is about the nameless main character who travels to this area this remote area in scotland every year to go camping and they set up a he sets up a camp uh, near enough to this loch that um he likes to go to and each year he's been there he has noticed that out in the middle of this loch there is a a small island and on the island they can see some sort of structure some sort of ruin and so on this trip he decides i'm going to get out to that ruin i'm going to explore i'm going to find out what it is and he doesn't fancy swimming through the water because because a lot of scottish lochs are notoriously dangerous they can look very calm on the surface but just a few feet below the water and there can be all sorts of currents which um people die every year basically because they don't they don't realize the dangers of of, of uh water even if it's slow moving on the surface so there are locks like this all over Scotland, but this one in particular came to me from a, a very early memory that I have, and I'm not sure if it was a dream or it's an incorrect memory, but my dad used to take me fishing, and I remember going to this place it wasn't a huge expansive loch but it was big enough um and we fished there and there was an island in front of us um but i've also i also recognized that you know there are you know calm and, and martin in a, a recent video visited a, a, an island on a, on a loch which has uh an old cottage on it which is now abandoned so there are plenty of places like that in scotland there's some famous places as well where the ruins actually a castle um or a tower of some description but this loch i just i have this image in my head of the structure on it and it's very difficult for me to truly trace where that image comes from but I do sense that at least a, a good part of it comes from a fishing trip with my dad. Um, I do remember sort of traipsing through a bunch of uh, reeds and overgrown, uh, an overgrown area around the loch. So it wasn't, certainly wasn't a place where people were going. Um, it was pretty inaccessible as far as I remember. So that, is where the image i think of that that rune comes from the idea of what was in the rune that's 
more i would say that's been more influenced by the stories that i i um already enjoy i've read and that uh films that i've watched tv episodes things like that i think part of it there's certainly the the suggestion in the story that there's a perhaps a science fiction element to this is this thing that lives at the bottom of this ruin otherworldly does it come from elsewhere um there there are little there are pretty overt hints to that but i'm not saying one way or the other like it it's just it feels like there's some sort of construction within the ruin doesn't it that there's something there and whether that's created by this creature or whether it's the ruin was built to hold the creature in uh there's no no uh conclusive answer to that uh to that question but certainly i think i was channeling some lovecraft some uh clark ashton smith especially um there's an episode of one of my favorite tv shows uh which is Koshak, the night stalker from the 1970s and there's an episode of that called spanish moss and I think the texture of this creature, and I wasn't thinking about it at the time, but there's a little bit of the texture of that. There's this huge humanoid thing that's a bit like Bigfoot walking around in that episode. Um, but there's there's the, the, the sort of strands of moss. I think maybe that's where some of it comes from. It's very difficult to tell sometimes where your ideas come from. People get asked that all the time, don't they? And you get a lot of writers who will say, you know, Oh, well, I go to an idea shop and I buy my ideas there. I have a little box, I have an idea box, and I open it up and an idea just comes forward. They get pretty defensive sometimes about that question because they get asked it over and over and over again. But I think there are some legitimate answers for where ideas come from. Um, in part, at least. You can you can trace some of the things that have influenced you to get there. Um, and sometimes you only know where, what those influences are after you've written something and you reread it down the line or you, or you think about it and you go, God, that's, that, yeah, that, there's an element of that there. So we all borrow. We all, uh, I, I never do it deliberately, of course. Um, I don't think there's any, I think the, the, the story itself is pretty, um, it's its own thing, you know, like it's not a carbon copy of anything that I've read. But... I did like the idea when I was writing it of trying to do a story that had more kind of the suggestion of something science fiction or otherworldly that went beyond the supernatural. Um, and I also liked the idea of, of, I mean, I love things like Invasion of the Body Snatchers, uh, both the, the original and the remake and the first remake and i love that kind of idea of the facsimile of human beings human beings being replaced by by things that look like them maybe even experience or feel like they are um the thing john carpenter's the thing uh, does that a little bit as well and this was kind of there's a hint towards that at the end of the story i mean i actually did something that i told myself i wasn't going to do again which is in the final paragraph i wrote a story a long time ago called the melancholy of herbert solomon and as much as i'm very fond of that story because it was in that sort of first run of stories that i shared online and got uh, a, a reaction from people from and it, um and it really helped me as a writer it's one of those stories where the 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 stuff that happens in the last paragraph which kind of tries to further um further enforce that this thing whatever's happened in the story is real rather than making it more or less ambiguous um and i think that that also there's a story called the christmas tree that i did and another one called off the beaten path which has some uh both those stories have a shared element with this story because i am 
fascinated by the Scottish wilderness. I'm also fascinated by the history of Scotland because there's much of it that's not understood, but we know people have been living here for thousands and thousands of years. And there are ruins and relics from peoples who we don't even know who they were. We don't know what they believed. We don't know what they looked like. We don't know anything about them or very little about them. And I go through Scotland very, I've mentioned this before, quite often if I'm travelling through Scotland, you'll look at the landscape and every now and then you'll see something and you'll think, that doesn't look at least like it was made by weather. You know, you'll see something that's grown over with trees, a hill, and you'll think, that looks like it's been shaped by someone and I wouldn't be surprised if there's much more to be found in Scotland. In fact, I'm certain that there is. I mean, they still find ruins and, and uh, relics all the time. So I'm I'm fascinated by that, and that sort of plays into this story as well, um, as that's been explored. But but Off the Beaten Path does, does that. The Christmas tree does that in terms of uh, its connection to the Scottish wilderness. But one thing that I do in both of those stories, and including Ruins in the Loch, is again, there's this paragraph at the end, which kind of, which explains things to the reader a little bit, um, and puts the possibilities out there. I said to myself I wouldn't, or at least I would try not to do that for a long time, but it just felt right for this story. People don't like a story that's maybe a little bit preachy. Um... But sometimes, especially when you're doing something that's a first-person narrative, when people write down what their experiences are, they write down what their thoughts are. They write down, if you have a journal, you write down what you're thinking, what you're feeling. And so to leave that out, I think, removes part of the charm of a first-person account. That subjectivity and that rumination, the thought, and that's why I put that in at the end. So that's the runes in the loch. It's kind of based on a on a very fuzzy memory I have when I, you know, from when I was younger. I can't even be certain this is one hundred percent real, which is fascinating. It's interesting about it, but I can see that loch and I can see the structure, as well. Um, who knows what it is? I'd love to find it. I'd love to see it. Um, but who knows what that thing on that island is? It's still. As far as I'm aware, it's still out there, so who knows? But uh, it, this story, I enjoyed doing it. I enjoyed writing it. I enjoyed narrating it and 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 writing the music for it. Um, and so it's it's a little bit, little bit of a departure for me. But almost everything I'm writing now is a little bit of a departure for me. I can feel myself moving in other directions. I think that's about it. Everything I can think of about that story for now. I really enjoy doing it and uh, I'm glad that a lot of you enjoyed that video and that episode of the podcast. Uh, the written version of that story, I'm not exactly sure where I'm placing it yet. I'm working on a paperback that's coming out soon and I may include it, I may include it, but I'm not 100% certain yet, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. Uh, for now, thanks very much for watching. If you would like to support my work, you can do so down below uh, by clicking on the link to my patreon and uh everything raised goes back towards uh producing episodes and writing and, and all that sort of stuff and thank you so much to those who have already already supported me so i'll see you all in the next video bye for now